See, there are some battles that God wants to fight for us, amen? But there are some battles that God wants to fight through us. See, I'm sure that many of us can recall conversations that we've had <laughs> that we regret, where you said things you probably shouldn't have said. Maybe sometimes you didn't really mean it, but you said it anyway because of the moment. You know, to the side. It's, it's, so, it's so sad because in the heat of the moment, we become very emotional, and sometimes anger will rise itself up. See, we become irrational, and we just blurt out what's on our minds with no filters. Maybe you said something that you felt, but you really didn't mean, but you really, after you said it, you realize you shouldn't have said it. How many, how many know what I'm talking about? And how many know that once those words go out, you can say, I'm sorry, you can say, forgive me, but come on, somebody, <laughs> they're out there. And especially, I got to be careful what I say to my wife. Come on, somebody. I got to be careful because, man, how many women have a memory? Come on, somebody. They can remember stuff, man, from way back in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when we got together, I mean, they, rem I mean, they had this file cabinet. Come on now. And, I mean, we, we celebrate 25 years next year of marriage. But Rosa can still pull her file out and say, do you remember 20 years ago when this happened? They have a filing system in their minds. And even though you said you're sorry, and even though they forgave you, come on, somebody. Once in a while, the devil opens up that file cabinet. Come on now. And all of a sudden, you man, you're done. Come on now. You're like, oh, my, I don't even remember any of that. Yeah, I still remember. So we got to be careful what we say because there's certain things that you can say I'm sorry for, but sometimes, and, and the hurt can still be there, and sometimes we can kind of do it and say it and then go back and say, oof, I shouldn't have said that. Because how many words, your words create your world? <laughs> that means good words will create a good world, and bad words will create a bad world. So how we speak and how we communicate has such an, important, uh, such an important part of what we do. There's an old saying that says this, it's better to remain quiet and let people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and erase all doubt. Turn to the person next to you and say, person, I think he's talking to you right now. <laughs> But tonight, I want to talk about the times when opening your mouth is crucial. There are times when declaring openly and forcefully are vital. There are times when expressing yourself out loud is imperative. There are times when remaining silent is not an option. Tonight, we're going to discuss the rules of engagement when confronting the devil. Come on, somebody. When, it's, when you confront the devil... It's time to open our mouths. Come on, somebody. It's time to begin to declare God's word. When it comes to the devil, I ain't taking no prisoners. Come on, somebody. Because he will not take prisoners either. You need to understand that your adversary only knows one thing. He only respects one thing. And it's not you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. It's God's word inside of you. The person that understands the authority and the power of God's word, and when you use that against the devil, the Bible calls it the sword of the spirit. Come on, somebody. And you see every other part of warfare that you see when you read about the warfare, the, 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 thing, the, 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 the armor of God, I'm sorry. When you read about the armor of God, everything is defensive. The helmet protects you from an attack. The shield protects you from an attack. The breastplate protects you from an attack. Everything is, everything is defensive except one thing. Come on, somebody. Because the, at the end of the day, it's this. The shield is there and all these things are there. But when you pull out the word, when you pull out the sword, come on, somebody. See, the sword is going if offensive. Now it's not, you're no longer just taking the hit. How many know that you, hopefully you can give more hits than how many you take? When somebody's in a boxing ring then the, and the judges are judging the fight, see, they, they'll judge how many times they get hit and they'll judge how many times they hit the other person. The person that wins, if there's no knockout at the end, is the person that hit the most. Come on, the one who got more punches in, that's the person that wins. So at the end of the day, we need to understand that God has already given us the tools that we need to make sure that we can speak what we need to speak and create the world that God 
has for us, amen? And how many know that everything that God does is surrounded by warfare? I gotta say that one more time. Maybe this side of the crowd might respond a little better. Let me walk over here. Everything that God does is surrounded by warfare. See, at the end of the day, if God's gonna do something, you might say, oh, God said he's gonna do it. Well, all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. Come on, somebody. The children of Israel were promised the, the promised land. They were promised, hey, it belongs to you. Now cross over, you know, cross over to the other side. When they got to the other side, they had to fight for every inch of that land. If God makes you a promise, be prepared to fight. Come on, somebody. Because the enemy is not just going to stand there and let that promise manifest itself. There's going to be opposition. Everybody say opposition. And when there's opposition, it's a sign of progress. See, when you see, when you feel an opposition coming your way, you're probably doing something right. People will oppose you, amen? People, how many of you know Christians will oppose you as well? I mean, everybody, every demonic force comes out and begins to oppose you when God begins to do something great because many people are just, they have, they have, a, they have a bond with our dysfunction. Come on, somebody. So when you start getting um, undysfunctioned, is that a word? When you, start, when you, start, when you, got, when you get dysfunctionated, <laughs> when you, all of a sudden, people, you start losing people. Come on now. Because they, they like you the way you were. They can relate to you when you were all jacked up. Now God's doing all this great stuff in your life, and they're like, oh, now they don't like you anymore. They'd rather have the old person back. I'm like, no, I don't want to be the old person. How I many you know not everybody's, not everybody's going to go with you where God is taking you? As a matter of fact, the higher you go, the smaller your circle gets. So be prepared. If, you, if you're getting ready to go to higher ground, just know not everybody's going to go on that journey with you. As a matter of fact, not everybody can. But just know this, that as you're going on this journey and you're going to higher ground, God's got people waiting for you there too. Come on, somebody. He's got people that you have to, so maybe some new relationships that you need to get connected to, some divine relationships that are going to take you to your next level as well. So you got to stay connected. And you know, God has this amazing plan, and we see it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to see this in action. We're going to see how God's word is. And this is a very familiar passage to many of us. But we're going, to, we're going to extract some things from this that I think is really going to help us to also be able to use what Jesus did. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, the word of God says this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the, God, uh, the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you. Say, Everybody say away. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Angels came and ministered to him. Wow. One of the keys of overcoming the devil is understanding the rules of engagement. Tonight's key rule is this. When the devil talks... You always talk back. Come on, somebody. See, a lot of us, a lot of us been taught not to talk back to our elders. Come on, somebody. Not to talk back to your parents. But when it comes to the devil, you have to talk back. You need to talk back. Whenever those voices say something that contradicts God in your heart or in your mind, you better talk back to that voice. You better have something inside of you that says, no, wait a minute, that doesn't belong to God. And you begin to talk back to those things as well. See, the problem is sometimes the devil talks to us and we just listen. And he, then he keeps talking and we just keep listening. 
And we keep internalizing those voices. And, we, and then we, here's the problem. If you listen long enough, you'll start believing it. Come on, somebody. Then all of a sudden, uh, the devil continues to talk, and, and we're just standing there taking it. See, it's time to use the word of God as a sword of the spirit and begin to talk back. Why? Why is it so important to talk back? This is why. Whoever has the last word wins. Come on, somebody. Whoever has the last word wins. Listen, let me tell you, that, let me tell you about my household. In my household, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how difficult our discussions get, I always have the last word. Yes, dear. Come on, I win every battle with that one. Come on, somebody. That's it. And, that, and see, if the devil has the last word, then your mood and your attitude will reflect what he said. See, if God has the last word, then your mood and your attitude will reflect that as well. So many times, depending on what we're allowing to enter our lives, it will change how we're functioning that day. See, it's time to stop being quiet, and it's time to open your mouth. Turn to the person next to you and say, open your mouth, man. Okay. No, we don't want to see your dentures or nothing. No, I'm just kidding. We don't want to see your fillings. See, it's time to talk back to the devil. It's time to talk back to the devil. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will. Jesus said, away with you, Satan. When he said that, the devil left. Could it be that we could do the same thing? That when those voices start coming in, that we can say, you know what, devil, away with you. The Bible says we can take every thought and bring it into captivity, Amen. We can captivate the thought and say, you know what? I, be, I bind up that thought and I cast you out. And the, the thought has to leave. And the devil has to leave too, amen? See, we need to understand that we cannot stay quiet. See, if, it, if, it, if it's, it's, it's time, some of you got to start talking to your circumstances. Yeah. See, some of you keep thinking about your circumstances. It's time to start talking to them. You know, say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Time out. Greater is he. Come on now, that's in me than he that is in the world. This circumstance is going on. No, no, you don't understand. That circumstance does not belong in my life. See, it's time to talk back to your addiction and say, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, somebody. See, it's time to talk back to your mountain and say, come on, man. Mountain, get out the way. The Bible says if you, if you speak to your mountain and you, don't, and you don't doubt what you say, the Bible says that Jesus at the mountain will, will get out of your way and it will be cast into the sea. I bet he was standing right in front of a giant mountain when he said that. And everybody looked at that like, wow. I mean, I could speak to that mountain. He said, I'm talking about the mountains in your life. The things that get magnified so big begin to speak to those things. And when you speak to those things, they begin to move. See, don't believe what the enemy is whispering in your ear or in your mind. See, the moment you open your mouth, your mind stops thinking and it starts listening and believing to what you say. Oh, I got to say that one more time. The moment you start talking, your mind has to stop thinking for that moment because now you're declaring something, and then it stops to listen what you have to say, and it believes it. Come on, somebody. So that's why the Bible says faith comes by hearing. See, it can be, hear it can be heard from somebody else, or it can be heard by yourself. Your own voice speaking God's word will make a difference. See, See your mind will only put out what you put in. And you have to continue to feed yourself in God's word. See, because a negative mind will never give you a positive life. You can tell people's mind in their hearts where they are by what they say. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So many times that negativity and the things people say, it's not, it's not a verbal issue. It's a heart condition. Because when you speak what you speak, it's coming from your heart. When somebody says they're just kidding, they're not. Come on, somebody. When people say, oh, they, they say, oh I'm just kidding. No, you're not. You, just, you, you wanted to just dig in a little bit, come on now, and, and then cover it up with humor. You felt that way for real. 
You're saying something that's in your That's why you got to be careful what we say. The Bible says be careful with, with, with your jest, with, with making fun of things and, and using comedy because many times there's a lot of truth based in that. How many know people can be offended as well when they become an object of your ridicule? We have to be very, very careful. So there's three areas that we're going to talk about really quick that he wants to engage us in as well, that, the, that, that God, that Jesus uh, was engaged by the devil, but now we can learn from this because the devil wants to engage us in the exact same three areas. The first one's found in Matthew chapter 4, 3 and 4. It says this, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you, are, if, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The first thing the devil do will engage you in your desires, in your desires. See, the devil will always engage you in the desires of your flesh. See, Jesus was hungry. His stomach was empty. The devil said, fill that void in your stomach. Fill that void in your life. See, the devil knows life is tough. Many circumstances in life can leave us empty on the inside. See, maybe your parents got divorced when you were young and it left you hurt and empty on the inside. See, maybe you were void socially. You felt a little awkward socially and you you felt left out. You weren't part of the crowd that was always connected. See, and that left you empty. Or maybe a girlfriend or a boyfriend broke your heart and it broke your heart and left you empty on the inside. And many times we don't release that. We become bitter in our relationships. See, the devil comes to us and says, wait wait a minute, I've got the answer for this emptiness. Here, drink this. Here, smoke this. Come on, somebody. Hey, hear this. Watch this. Touch this. See, the devil always appeals to our appetite for attention, our appetite for acceptance, and our appetite for pleasure. Come on, somebody. So the devil's always going to bring that in because he's going to take us the desires that God gave us. He's going to take them and warp them, and you try to use them to take you down. See, but Jesus, I love what Jesus said, but he answered, he said, wait a minute, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. We're not just talking about the bread that you eat. See, when I read this today, something happened on the inside. I said, wait a minute, he's talking about life altogether. Man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live by just the physical things that we have. What God says is where life is. Come on, somebody. The words that God says is where life is found. So if we use the words that God says and we say them, there's life. Come on, somebody. There's life in the word. And we need to remember that, especially as Christians that have that Bible. How many have a Bible in your hand right now? Just wave, wave it like this. Just wave it for me. There it is. How many have your, you know, some of you guys lifting your phones, your iPads? Amen. Hey, listen, at the end of the day, that book and that word is such a powerful tool that we need to dig in and make sure. Because listen, here's the key. You got to remember, if you don't talk back, the devil will rob you of your peace and keep you confused. If you don't talk back, he'll rob you of your joy and keep you depressed. If you don't talk back, he'll rob you of God's promises. Talk back. Don't stay quiet. Many of us don't talk back because we don't spend enough time in God's word so that we can know what to say. Oh, come on, somebody. See, you have to spend enough time in God's word so you can understand what part of the sword you need to pull out. Come on, somebody. You need a specific weapon. You need a specific point to attack certain places. And unless you're in God's word regularly, you won't know what to pull out. It's like, it's like the, guy, the, the, the guys who were sitting at the bar. I guess I shouldn't say a bar joke in church. But anyway, they were, they were sitting together talking, and they got into a big argument, right? So the, so the guy said, come on, let's just step outside. So they step outside, and, and all of a sudden, the, the, the one guy comes in by himself. He goes, wow, that was quick. What happened? He goes, not a problem. He brought a knife to a gunfight. Come on, somebody. See, we need to make sure that when the devil pulls out a knife, we got the word of God. Come on, somebody. And we got a double barrel loaded up, ready to take him out. Because at the end of the day, he wants to kill, to steal, and to destroy your life. He doesn't just want to ruin it. He wants to take you out. Turn to him and say, neighbor, man, you got to watch this devil. Because he's trying to take us out. 
And we need to know that we can speak, because here's the deal. When you speak like God, you speak for God. When you speak like God, you speak for him. In other words, you speak with his authority. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 1 John 2.14 says this, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And look at this, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. See, the word of God has to abide in us if we're going to overcome. And abide doesn't mean a casual glance at the word. Come on, somebody. Abide means that you read it, and it becomes, it begins, it saturates your life. It abides in you. It lives in you. It becomes active. Amen. It's constantly moving. It's constantly doing what God wants it to do in our lives. See, so often I hear Christians say, well, the devil's on my back. How many of you have heard that before? Man, I've had a tough day. The devil's just on my back. Maybe the devil's on your back because you ain't talking back. Come on, somebody. Because the moment you start talking back, all you got to do is say, get off my back, Jack. Oh, come on, man. I'm going to start rolling here. <laughs> get off my back, Jack, because I'm about to attack. And I ain't going to cut you no slack because I just get whacked. Come on, somebody. Come on, I'm a poet, didn't know it. Come on, man. That wasn't even in my notes. Come on, that was a Holy Ghost rap right there. Somebody take notes of that. Can somebody please take a note of that somewhere? I got I to gotta bring that back and do something with it. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, when you know what to say, the devil will obey. Oh, I got to say this one more time. When you know what to say, the devil will obey. Because he understands the authority. See, so many times that we just understood how important God's word is. We can use it. I love it, man. Praise God. The second thing is this. He tempted you in your desires. He's also going to tempt you in your doctrine. In your doctrine. Your Bible knowledge. Matthew 4, 6, 7 says this. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For, here we go. Here's the devil now. For it is written. Oh, come on now. How many of the, the devil knows the Bible? Uh, he knows it a whole lot better than we do. And he knows how to twist it. You know, how, you know how you can tell the devil knows the Bible real well? Because there's so many people out there, there's cults, and there's all these, all these movements of religion that have a little truth. Come on, somebody. They have the Bible mixed in with other stuff. So, that, so there's enough deception, because the Bible says, I'm going to give them enough truth to distract them, but at the same time, I'm preaching a lie. It's either all truth or it's no truth. Come on, somebody. It can't be mixed in. Well, I'm just going to believe this part. Listen, at the end of the day, I believe from Genesis to Revelation, it's all true. And this is not a, this is not a smorgasbord or cafeteria where you get to pick, well, I want to eat just this part. Come on now. And I don't need to eat this part. At the end of the day, the Bible is true from beginning to end, from cover to cover. And if we understand that, we need to understand our, do our doctrine. Because the, the devil says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. In, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Here we see the devil quoting scriptures again. He's trying to use God's word to entice Jesus to do something careless. The problem with the devil in this situation, he's trying to use the word of God against the word. Come on, somebody. He is the word. The Bible says in John, first, uh, John first, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the, and the, was with God, and the, was God, and the word became flesh. Oh, come on now. How many know that you cannot pull the word against the one who wrote the word? Come on, somebody. You can't, I mean, he's not, he didn't just write the word, he is the word. The Bible says that he is the word incarnate. So at the end of the day, the Bible is trying to trick him. And of course, I, I remember, this is so powerful. I remember when we used to go out street witnessing uh, on Gray Street, we used to come across people, man, they knew the Bible. I mean, I remember coming across a group of guys who were uh, actually dealing drugs on Gray Street in Laurel one time. And me and a, a friend of ours, we were both witnessing, we had our Bibles and we walked out there. And man, I didn't know, the, I, I hardly knew my Bible. I was only saved like... I don't know, 90 days, like just a few months. And I went out there and began to minister to people. And man, they, they know the Bible. They start quoting all these scriptures, stuff that I didn't even know at that point. 
How many know when you're in jail? Come on, maybe you don't. You got a lot of time on your hands. So a lot of folks read the Bible. They learn the word. See, they learn it, but they just don't let the word learn them. Come on, somebody. They might read the Bible, but how many know the Bible will read you? And when it does read you, you have to align yourself to it. So I remember so many times I would be there, and these guys would know all, these, all this Bible, and I would sit there, man. And then I remember one time they, they, after, after they quoted all their Bible and they were just talking, and I, and I said, I just I asked them just one question. And I just said this. I said, you know, you know the Bible better than I do. But let me ask you a question. What has the knowledge of the word done for you? He got quiet. Because they were all high. Come on, somebody. I think I I messed up their buzz on that one right there. Come on, somebody. I mean, they just knocked somebody's buzz right out on that one. Because obviously they stopped and thought about it. I said, wait a minute, I'm still high. I'm still all jacked up. I'm dealing drugs. So I guess maybe maybe what I know is not helping me a whole lot. Because how many know it's not what you know, it's what you believe? It's what you believe that makes it. Because a lot of folks know stuff. That doesn't mean you believe it. Because if you believe it, it makes an impact in your life. So so the the doctrine is something that, and and, and I love this. This is so cool. Jesus reminds the devil of his identity. (laughs) He says, devil, don't you know who you're talking to? You can't tempt the Lord, your God. Oh, come on, somebody. Do you you think he's talking about somebody in the third party? He's talking about himself. He said, said, I'm, I'm giving you my identity. See, I know who I am. See, here's my question. When the devil comes at you, do you know who you are? Do you know what God says you are? See, Jesus began to say, and I love this, and he reminds him of his identity. See, and when you talk to the devil, let him know what God's word says about you. I'm a child of the living God. Come on now. I said, devil, you're not up against just anybody here. I am a child of the living God. I'm an heir to the throne. I'm part of the chosen generation. Come on now. At the end of the day, you start, and I'm a member of the royal priesthood. I'm the head and not the tail. Come on now. I am more than a conqueror. See, the moment the devil comes at you to try to tear you down, come on now. When he comes and tries to accuse you of your past, remind him of his future. Come on now. Because at the end of the day, God is going to do some great and mighty things. And we need to know who we are. Say, listen, I stand on God's precepts. I walk in God's presence. I live in his purpose. And I speak in his power. If you understand that and you speak that over yourself and you know who you are in your identity, then the, how many of the devils already defeated? Oh, man. See, we, we, we go against the devil like he's actually, like he actually has power to do something. Listen, 2,000 years ago, the Bible says Jesus went to the cross, and he triumphed over the sin and death. Come on, somebody. We're fighting a foe who's already defeated. And until we realize that, we give too much power and too much credit to a foe who's already lost the war. He may have a couple of battles still left in them, but he's lost the war. So you need to understand who you're up against. It's like when you watch the movie The Wizard of Oz, one of my favorite movies, right? And I love when they're trying to find the great Oz, right? This big thing shows up. It's like, oh, my God, look at this guy with fire flying off, and it's this big screen. It's like, my goodness. And all of a sudden, the dog slides over to the curtain, come on down the side, and Toto, come on, man, Toto done blew his cover. Come on now. Told her to slid over there and started play with the curtain. When she went over, the curtain, and all of a sudden, and, there, and there's he, there he is. That's the devil. The devil makes all this noise. Come on, man. He looks like a big old elephant, but he ain't nothing but a little mouse. Come on now. He's a little mouse with an amplifier making all kinds of noise. <laughs> and at the end of the day, we need to understand who our adversary is. He is slick, and he is he's really, really slick, so don't underestimate him. But the same, do not fear him. Come on, somebody. He needs to fear you. He needs to understand. He only fears the people that know who they are in Christ. If you know who you are in Christ, then you can get up every single day and know that it's going to be all right. Turn to the person next to you and say, person, it's going to be all right. You see, the devil's a liar. He'll promise you everything and leaves you with nothing. The devil wants to belong, wants what belongs to God. The devil wants what belongs to God. He wants your worship. See, the devil was, worship, was the worship leader in heaven. We're, we're going to talk about this on Saturday. He was the worship leader in heaven. 
Why are we doing time? Good. See, I'm going to say this. In he- when God created everything, he created three W's in heaven. He created three angels that were the archangels. They had special gifts, special talents. The first angel was the angel of the word. His name was Gabriel. Come on, somebody. Whenever God wanted a word to go from heaven to earth, he would give it to Gabriel, and Gabriel was the messenger. Come on now. And he brought the message. The second one he did was the warrior. So we had, a, we had, so we had the word, and now we have the warrior. There's an angel named Michael. Whenever there's a battle to be fought in the heavenlies, he is the chief in command, and right away he says, Michael, take care of this light word. Come on, somebody. And Michael, the, the angel, the Bible says, and you read about it uh, when, you, when, you talk, when, you, when you read in Daniel, when he prayed and it took 21 days, the Bible says, for him to receive his, his, uh, his, his, his uh, answered prayer, the, the, the Gabriel said, listen, man, uh, God answered, you know, 21 days ago, but me and, me, me and Michael, man, we were in a battle. Come on, somebody. We had a fight to get here, but Michael was the, the warrior angel. And the last one was this, the worship, the worship angel. His name was Lucifer, the angel of light. Ezekiel speaks about him. The Bible says that he, he eluded music just kind of came out of him. The Bible describes him as this amazing being, beautiful, an angel of light. The Bible says that one of the most beautiful creatures ever. And he, he knows music. It just, it just eludes out of him. He, he, he had all the angels. And, and of course, now he's leading the worship. And they've all, everybody's worshiping. And, and all of a sudden, he, he looks at himself and says, man, I'm pretty awesome. I look pretty good. Darn. Maybe I, maybe, maybe I should be worshiped too. And the Word of God says that that, that, of course, we know what happens. He, 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 he got cast out of heaven and got cast to the earth. And the Bible says with a third of the angels. I believe that was probably the choir. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I, figured, I figured he probably had the most influence over his choir. Come on now. He's, 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 he's leading worship, and he's got these, this, all these choir members. You know, I remember, I remember how many of you guys know Vernon McGee is? Remember? Through the Bible, through the Bible bus, I love Vernon. He said, "He says, yeah." He said, "A third of the angels uh, were cast down with him, and they all ended up in choirs all over churches, all over the place." Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm giving the choir a hard time. They're looking at me like, "What? What are you saying, Pastor? Then you must be Satan because you lead us." Ooh, come on, somebody. I'm not Lucifer. But anyway, God, I'm having too much fun. Listen, let me, let me bring this in for a close. At the end of the day, the devil wants your worship. You know how you, but it's not worship like we think it is. See, let me tell you how he wants you to worship him with your money. You want to know what you worship? Look at your checkbook. Where are you spending your money? Where are you spending your time? You want to see what you, what you worship? Look at what, where you put your time because he wants to take your time. And what are you doing with your talents and your gifts? He wants to take your ga- their talents and your gifts and use them for himself. That's what worship is. But to hear, I'm, t- I'm telling you this. When we begin to worship God, let's all stand to our feet. We're going to just close right now on this right here at this point. I think it's a great time for us to start to close this thing. It's, 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 it's what God wants us to do. And see, his pride made him feel that he was greater than God. And, and if, the devil, if the devil has your worship, he has you. If he can keep you distracted and you're worshiping things, other things in your life, then he can easily distract you. See, if you worship the devil at the altar of drug addiction, you'll be in bondage. Come on, somebody. If you worship the devil at the altar of materialism, you'll be in debt. Oh, come on now. If you worship the devil at the altar of sexual pleasure, you'll be in captivity. If you worship the devil at the altar of selfishness, you'll be alone. If you worship the devil at the altar of sin, You'll be lost. See, whatever you're devoted to receives your worship. And God wants, and the devil wants whatever you're devoted to. Because if he can get your devotion, he can get you. Amen? Amen?